Okay, we're in my studio here in Wilton, Connecticut. And in this studio, which my wife designed for me, thank you very much, I got a skylight overhead, I got lots of lights, I've got some ceiling height, and I've got a lot of distance, and I have these easel bars that can be adjusted to any height so I can do big, big paintings or small, small paintings. Now the process of making one of these paintings, it varies. But one idea that I borrowed from the 19th century from Turner is to just do some quick one minute, two minute watercolors very fast. And you just, he didn't have a camera to go snap, 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 snap. So he goes out with his little sketchbook and quickly, in watercolor or in pencil, comes up with these little vignettes. Then if he gets an idea that shows up in the spontaneous explosion of color and design, He'll say, oh, I think I may try that in an oil. And he tries that in an oil. A little bigger, maybe. And this will be Constable's approach and many other artists' approach. And from this, as I just went, whoop, 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 to something bigger over here. And this is an oil on anodized aluminum. And in this case, I'm using some newer materials. I painted half of this painting vertical like this and half of it flat, flat, with a hairdryer blowing the paint around. But let's go back to the watercolor because I want to take you to where these things have their genesis. To the beginning, a good place to start, the beginning. So you've got an idea, one, two, three, each one getting a little bigger, each one getting a little bigger. And if these things are to be idea generators, you can't get possessive about them. You have to see where the paint goes. Now here is a, is a piece of 300 pound watercolor paper, masked off. Now watercolor paper all has glue sizing in it. That's all this has on it, is glue sizing. And I just started to push the paint in quickly, really quickly. We're really talking two, three minutes, nothing more, one minute. To get an effect, a psychological effect. I'm not trying to get transcriptive information. I'm not making a manual. Nobody reads their camera manuals because they're boring. Now here's one on a varnished paper. And I just smashed the color in, dark at the bottom, a little blue, two different blues, ultramarine blue, shaving blue, with a little bit of white in it, making it a little, little bit opaque. And the interesting thing happens when I'm doing this very fast, you see these interesting drip marks. When you're spontaneous and fast, you can exploit the accidents. If you're not, accidents won't happen for you to exploit. So you don't get to follow the paint. You try to prescribe what's going to happen. And you never get a great painting when you're trying to prescribe what's going to happen. So we let the paint have things happen. And that's what, why doing it quickly works. Then I try it a little bit larger and try other things. I'm using the same colors. Red oxide, shaving blue light, ultramarine blue, a little white, that's all. And as I use the oil, I notice that the colors are a little different because the medium, there's a linseed oil that's making this powdered pigment into a paint, and there's gum arabic making this powdered pigment into a paint, but it's the same, exactly the same pigment. I'm using the same manufacturer, so it's the same pigment. Now from here, and this is an oil on linen, just a little study, I'm going to go over here whoa, to something big, er, and this is oil on anodized aluminum. It's 36 by 36 inch sheet of aluminum, white, anodized with a white enamel onto the aluminum, makes it very smooth. And I like a very smooth, fast surface. Smoother than this quadruple hand-primed Belgian linen, which is here. If Monet was right, and I think he was, he said, expand the vocabulary of the brush strokes. Well, that means the brush making marks you can make the marks with your fingers, you can make them with rags, you can make them with brushes, and you can make them with air. And you know they're not the same thing. And it's the joy of feeling what paint can do. What people do is they lose the gesture as they try to smooth things out. People make the decisions out of anxiety rather than out of authenticity. What they really believe is good. Let something organic and exciting and visceral and spontaneous still live in the painting. And it happened because of what you learned here. So let's see how to do this sort of thing. Now, I don't know if they're gonna work. These could be train wrecks, like that. So let's go over here, let's put some paint up and see what we've got. What is this? I have no idea. Okay, I think it's Schrebening Blue Deep. 
which is different than shavening blue light. A little ultramarine. Here is some transparent red oxide. A white. Okay, I'm rinsing the brushes to be supple. These brushes are one and a half inch brushes, synthetic sable. So now I think, 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 think. And you do a lot of this, for which we don't have time on camera. So imagine, cut, oh, here I am back again. I've been thinking for the last 30 or 40 minutes, okay? And now I look and I say, where do I want to go? Where do I want to go? And I've been thinking about the shape and the amount of ground and how the sky will have a certain motion. Now you can use photographs, you can use the landscape, you can use lots of things. I use all of those things. Just don't copy your source, see what happens in the paint. Maybe it would be good if I showed you a photograph so you could see how much you would change even working from a photograph. I'll put this one up here. And this one over here. Let's do the one on the untreated paper. But of course, it is treated paper because it's watercolor paper. All watercolor paper is watercolor paper because it has glue sizing in it, more or less, depending on the brand. Now, if I wet the surface, the paint will bleed differently than if I don't wet the surface. And I can do it either way. I'll just splash some water on here just for the fun of it. And to show you the kind of nonchalance and cavalier spirit you should be infused with. Now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to take a little of this red oxide and a little of this scravening blue. See how it gets an interesting green? Look at those textures. Okay, here we go. Dark brush. Okay, light brush. Ultramarine blue. And a lot of it. Ah, shape, 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 shape. I want an interesting shape. And I'm going to let the paint drip, because that's kind of fun. And I'm going to come back in now with the shavening blue light. And i got to do this quickly while it's all really wet. This has to be done quick, 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 quick. You can hear my, my mother say, quick like a bunny, David. Get in your pajamas. You're racing a train. Because if you stop, you'll be thinking too much and be saying, oh, that doesn't look like the right thing here, and that maybe is the wrong thing there. And Back to the dark side. Okay, you've got your one or two minute watercolor. Stop, go to the next one. The idea of making the painting come alive is to breathe life into it, consecration. And you do that by making it independent, giving it a life force of its own so it can stare back at you and you have a relationship. And we do that by taking off the edges. And now that those borders establish the painting as its own identity. And you've got the window onto deep space. <laughs>